Okay, well, we just came from Prospect Park. Yeah. No birds. We tried our best, but we, it's still winter time. Well, it's, it's 11 p.m. also, which is begins sort of the quiet time because they've had their big feeding. From 11 a.m. 11 a.m. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. did I say 11 p.m.? Yeah. Well, that's what it feels like. Yeah. It might as well be 11 p.m. <laughs> <I know. laughs> and that's okay. I knew, I knew we might not see much. And, we, and the, part of the part of the park we were in, there's just not a lot of food where we were. Yeah. You know, so, there's, yeah. so it's not uh, right. productive. Right. And that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. So are you getting birds at your feeder these days? Definitely, In, in yeah. your backyard? Yeah, you definitely. Are. What are you getting? Well, in Brooklyn, I'm getting, um, well, I just saw a red-tailed hawk. No, I saw a Cooper's hawk the other day because, of course, they're very hungry. And when they come, feeders are a great spot for them because there's a lot of possibilities. Uh -huh. um, a lot of house sparrows, um, uh, morning doves, pigeons, of course. Um, a couple of dark-eyed juncos. They're like little slate-colored birds that um, I believe are in the sparrow family. Um, and white-throated sparrows. Maybe six species at this point. Wow. Yeah. And when does it start getting Picking really up? good? Yeah. At my feeder? Yeah. Um, springtime. Spring. Springtime. Yeah. The most I've had is probably 12 to 13 species, which wow. isn't bad for Brooklyn wow. at all. So what's the draw with you and birds? What's the, were you a bird in another lifetime? Or was there just, what's the connection? So I've always loved birds, but I didn't know that there were other people like me that liked birds. So it was like, I was liking birds quietly and without really knowing how much I was liking them. I always had a feeder up. But I wasn't really conscious of birds. So I got conscious of birds about 10 years ago. And some of that had to do with living upstate, or visiting upstate, and starting to see the rhythms of the natural world. Some of that had to do with Twitter and the iPhone, in that I realized there were other people like me through Twitter. And I realized that they were going to places like Prospect Park or Central Park, and they were going to look at birds. So, you know, it's interesting because Twitter does a lot of things, and we associate it with a certain person in the White House right now, but it also helps to form communities. And that's, I mean, I guess that, in a way, that's the good thing about social media. It, 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 exactly. Yeah. And, you know, in, in fact, there was an article about bird Twitter and how... Someone who did not really like birds, didn't not not like birds, but didn't really they weren't that into birds, but they started getting into bird Twitter and they're so happy. What is bird Twitter? Well, it's just there's a lot of people on Twitter who are focused on birds. Really? And it's a beautiful, it's a really joyous way to a perspective, a great perspective of a, a, a beautiful angle with which to look at life through bird Twitter. And what do you do on bird Twitter? Well, you you hear about, you you get information, technical information, but you also get like uh, people looking at birds, people talking about behavior, people commenting on, on uh, you know, relationships. They, it's meaning, meaning that they're finding through birds. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. it's, so it's meaning. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because you have to have a lot of patience, I think, because birds move quickly, and as you mentioned in the park, uh, binos are not that easy to operate. You have to, it's, it's a very particular kind of thing. It's not as easy as watching, you know, elephants in the zoo or, you know, going on a safari where you're seeing big animals, and it's very much more delicate in a way, much more detailed. It is. It, it's, it's a lot of things. I mean, it's deep, actually, what birding can do. Because, well, you're involving your senses, but even more so, you are, it requires you to listen. So, I talk in this one woman show I'm working on, and well, that I'm in the process of getting out there. I talk a lot about the sense of hearing and the skill of listening. And that the difference between the two is paying attention. And the thing that I realized is that 
the main skill I use when I'm acting is listening. And the main skill I'm using when I'm burning is listening. But listening is really hard. And it's really profound to listen. And I'm not listening most of the time. And also, it relates to me to being in the moment. Exactly. Because, exactly. Know, and, and those it's, are things that are very, very connected. Ex exactly. And they're all things that are difficult, require effort, um, muscle, um, that going in and out of. I'm going always going in and out of. I'm never going to be able to do it perfectly. The minute I'm aware of I'm, that I'm listening, I'm not really listening anymore in a way, right? It's the same thing with acting. It's like when you're in the moment, and I'm like, oh, I'm in the moment. Oh, no, I'm not in the moment. Because you're thinking. Because I'm not, yeah, yeah no, I've got to get back in the moment. But so how do you get back into the moment? Yeah. How do I kind of gracefully, without being mean to myself or getting mad at myself or whatever, kind uh, of gracefully go back between the two, in and out, in and out? Because that's what it is. It's mm -hmm. going to be in and out. Mm -hmm. And when you say basically most of the time you're not listening, is it because your mind is going too fast and you're going somewhere else and yeah because yeah. I'm doing a lot of other things yeah or I'm because it's scary it's scary to deep, to listen because it's as you said being in the moment we're all scared of being in the moment because because for many reasons um, but but one of the things is I find that I'm imposing a lot I'm imposing like well that's a this or I'm assuming we're judging judging assume, not discerning I'm judging and there's the diff there's a difference you know I'm doing a lot of things except just being and letting it mm -hmm. speak to me. Mm -hmm. that's it. And that's what I do with the character a lot, too. Mm -hmm. I'm telling her, she, her, her who she is. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. everything but just stopping and letting her tell me. And that's yeah. where the scary stuff happens. That's what's scary, and, but that's where the deep stuff happens and the really meaningful stuff. You know, it's interesting because in writing, I have also felt that where if you let it come through you, where to some extent you're a channel, then it, it is in some ways more authentic and creative than imposing your uh, ideas as a writer. To let them come through you as opposed to pushing, pushing, pushing. Yeah, that's it, the channel, yeah. You know, I think most people would not think of listening as the really hard work of acting. They would probably think of emoting on some level, creating a visual and, uh, you know, creating the physical part of a character as opposed to listening. But you're saying that, wait a second, no, being in the moment is listening to what's happening. Yeah, and I think so because that's where for me, like when you talk about the emoting, well the emoting is going to happen because you're connected to what, hold on, because you're connected to what the character is going through. You, you get connected to what the character is going through by listening to what her circumstances are, what she is experiencing through that, and then the food from the other actor. And all that will create the authentic emotion as opposed to, like, you can tell crocodile tears. You can tell when somebody's, yeah, like, they're like, really. they're like, yeah, they, or they're feeling a lot, but I'm not feeling anything. That's another thing that happens a lot. That actor is feeling so much, there's actually no room for me here uh -huh. as an audience member. Uh -huh. Like, if there's something that's not generous about it or so there's something that's it's about them, you know? But how can you leave space so that that there's room for me as another human, fellow human being to feel alongside you mm -hmm. and with you? Mm -hmm. You've been acting for, what, over 30 years? Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. And you are very versatile. You're, you're very well known in the business. You're not a star. That's okay with you. Yeah, that, yeah. I'm, I'm an actor. I'm a working actor. Work it. You are, yeah. and you work a lot. Yeah. You, yeah. You work a lot. Yeah. I mean, you're. You know, I remember you. Uh, I know you from Six Feet Under, sure. a television series uh, in which you played 
Nate, who is yeah. one of the main characters, mm -hmm. a one night stand, you become pregnant. Yeah. You're not a very likable character right. in that in that you know series. But I don't think you had a good time in that series either, right? right. I mean, there wasn't a very collaborative atmosphere, or they weren't interested in suggestions from the actors, or did you hear that from another actor? No, on the thing? I didn't. I read. I read it. Uh, from me or I from somebody from else? You saying it was not one of the greatest experiences of your career? Not true. No? Not true. No. Um, it was different that TV. That was when I realized with TV that uh, uh, creating the character is very different because you don't have all the information. Oh, because the director is not giving you the information. Because they don't know. Because uh -huh. they don't know. They don't. For a few reasons. Sometimes they do know and they don't want to tell you for various reasons. Sometimes they don't know and that's why they're not telling you. Um, because the, 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 the next episode hasn't been written yet or the whole thing has not been mapped out yet? Well, because it's changing. It uh -huh. might have roughly been mapped out, but it's changing. Sometimes they don't like to tell you because uh, for leaks, the leaks coming out. Um, of power there's but that one I think they didn't know uh-huh and um made it harder for you very yeah that's hard yeah yeah that's very hard uh-huh yeah yeah because you're usually like the creating of a character is very complex yeah and based on all the information you have the situation and it's sort of like you you know, finding out your character's a psychopath. Mm. Or no, uh, a, a, a serial killer, let's say. Psychopath. You Which you don't know at the beginning? You well, might not know that. Wow. Well, that's big information. Yeah. Um, and and that, that would probably have made some, you know, affected some mm -hmm. decisions. Mm -hmm. um, but here you have season three. You find out your character's a serial killer. Okay. Um... So that means that the character has to really be capable of anything. Mm. And in a way, human beings are. So that's why TV is kind of interesting. Because it gets to like something kind of real about human beings. But it doesn't make the actor's job very easy. Wow. I, I didn't realize, I mean, that would seem to me a big jump. If you are playing a character and you don't know that character is a serial killer until like the third or fourth episode or something like that. Oh my God. I know. I, does it, doesn't it negate everything you've done? That's come before in right. some way. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's really yeah. hard. So you have yeah. a lot of work to do to help justify that, so the character can be with you and make the jump with you. You know. But if you're like, if you if you break the law of physics in a way, and like mm -hmm. they're like the audience is like, no, I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. You've got to get them to buy it, mm -hmm. and yeah. it's very difficult. You know, um, I, I also remember you from I Shot Andy Warhol. Right. Uh, where you played Valerie Solanas. So yeah. The first who tried to, who sh who tried to kill him. Yeah, right. right. Um, which was a, a great role. And then, and you've been in so many horror movies. Yeah. Now, is this because, why is this? Because you gravitate towards horror? Or these are the parts that have been offered? Or what's Well, the... I mean, it started with The Haunting, which which um, was my first kind of big commercial movie. And, you know, it was the end of the 90s. Um, and I thought it would be interesting because I'd been doing so many independents. Um, that turned out not to... I thought it was going to be a really interesting experience. Um... That one was difficult because it was a lot of CGI, and whereas when I signed on to it, I was told it wasn't going to be a lot of CGI. This is computer uh, generated, generated technology, yeah. and so I thought it was going to be, uh, you know, a remake of the one with the wonder Julie Harris, who was a theater actress, great mm -hmm. actress, mm -hmm. um, very scary movie, very interesting movie. I thought that that I, I'm interested in that. Yeah. Um, so that was my first horror movie, and then I really it was a did disappointment. It. Yeah, yeah. And then the next one was um, The Conjuring, and that I found interesting because um, uh, the script was really good, and that's a classic in some way, right? Yeah. And, I mean, it's become exactly a, a, a you know a, a star of the horror exactly. genre. And so it's like I I'm I'm open to. Um, 
what interests me is that the director is really the first thing that interests me, even over over genre, over character, over, and and I found the director really interesting on that. Who was that? James Wan. And um, what what else has he done? Has he oh, done he's done a lot, a yeah, a uh, lot, yeah. yeah. Um, and and so I found that very interesting. Um, and and I think the conjuring is really interesting because the genre doesn't matter. Um, mm -hmm. Why that movie worked, I think, is because of the the uh, the story, the relationships, the the level of acting in that, and the level of acting was high because um, the um, the relationships were there, the mm -hmm. the, the truth mm -hmm. was there. Mm -hmm. the, so um, and you played a mother of five children, mm -hmm. a family moving into a rundown house that mm -hmm. was basically haunted, and you become possessed mm -hmm. as the mother, yeah. correct? Yeah. And blood curdling screams. How did you learn how to do the blood curdling screams? So blood curdling yeah, screams. So how did you get into that in the conjuring? Well, so I realized, you know, I'm gonna, you know, blow my my voice out, and I need to know how to do this because screaming is a big part of of um, possession. Uh, you know, I went on and looked at some. Unfortunately, I had to look at some exorcisms, which. I don't recommend. Real exorcisms. Yeah. On YouTube. They're oh they're they're God. very it's Ooh. it's pretty dark. Ooh. But they make a an an an, an otherworldly sound. And um, so I realized so I, I, I looked up how to scream and I came upon these um, it's called like it's not death metal, it's like I don't know what the hell kind of music it's called, but they basically scream. And these guys were blowing their voices out, and they found this woman who taught them how to scream. And um, she has CDs and stuff. And so I got her CDs and, you know, learned how to scream. And, um, and that's how I did it. And it saved your voice? Oh, yeah. 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 Um, uh, so, and then I watched the exorcisms, and then... Oh, you remember the exorcisms? Oh my yeah. god, that thing was scary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Her yeah. eyes. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what about the possession part? How did you work on that? That's Yeah, um, I know. Like, um the thing about the about possession is you're not um you're not really here or there. You're 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 taken over. Yeah, you're taken over, and it's, so you're not quite in the human realm, and you're not not quite in the animal realm. You're kind of in um, this strange other world, you know. And so, to to um, I guess get more in touch with um, a wild, a wild, but a scary wild, because it's yeah. it's um, not the id even. It's not even the id. It's it's um, an animal. It's an animal like quality. Hmm. Yeah. 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 Did you did you take it home with you, or you're not the kind of actor who does that? Well, I think that um, you always kind of take it home, and so even if you're not the actor who does that, like I'm not method, I'm not a method actor, so I'm not like Daniel Day Lewis where I I'm in it all the time, but but um, it's like you almost can't help but not take it home. Um, so there's, you need to find, the actor needs to find ways, rituals, really, to, to, to protect themselves from the uh, character. And, um, and the Greeks did that. The Greeks helped the actor with that. And they had masks, and they had other things to help them. And we don't really have those things today. So when you say rituals that the characters develop the rituals or you're you become aware of like the habits of the character is is that what you mean by ritual or tell no. Me no I mean for instance like for me um when I wear a wig for a character right and when I take the, when I put the wig on and then when I take the wig off it is a ritual with closing Closing the line between the character and I, so when I go home, 
it's a clear demarcation. You take off the wig and you are you return to yourself yeah. to some degree. Yeah. But when you said you're not a method, you're not a method actor. Technically method, like so. Today. What do you mean? What What's the demarcation for you? Well, okay. So first of all, the word method got bastardized. From Stanislavski, really was looking at actors, observing them, and he realized they had a way. They had a method, and so he wrote that down. There were things he saw actors doing, and then um, Lee Strasberg, yeah, bastardized it. And um, but and and it's you know whatever. It's it's used in different ways. Um, but like how Daniel Day Lewis, meaning that. He immerses himself completely in the situation that the character would be in. He lives like the character, he eats like the character, so on. And um, th that's a level that is, is very admirable. Um, I can't do, I can't go to that level. It just doesn't work for me. Um, so I'm not method in that way, but um, I have my own method, you know. And yeah. the method is something of what you just described before about the ritual things that you associate with the character? My, my, well, one of the main things is my method, the first thing about my method is um, clearing out before I begin. And that's very difficult. That in itself is get a whole process. Get rid of Lily, essentially. No, no, no. It's not get rid of Lily. It's getting the channel clear. It's getting clearing out in the sense of a blank slate. So one of the one of the meanings of character is um, it comes from uh, an instrument, an etching, uh, a making a mark, to make a mark. Um, and that's where the character would form from the marking. Mm -hmm. So I need to make a blank slate. So there's, there's a clear uh, Air surface to make the marks of the character on. Uh -huh. But that and, surface and is me. Right. Okay. It's me but it, but plus it, the character equals the character. So you're making room for this character. And in a way, it relates to what we were talking about earlier about the listening exactly. and being in the moment exactly. and being there for, to take that in. So, so that, that I can clear out. Put that out. It's like an eye thou. It's yeah. like clearing out so that I can meet her for who, for who she is. I find out that. And then I can start saying, Okay, I think I'm getting who you are. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna be taking all that and I'm gonna be playing you, and I'm gonna be feeling your circumstances. You, I now know how you would feel about those circumstances, but it's me. I, right. You can't help it. Right. Because some right. of the characters don't like me, and I gotta say, I'm I, that's I'm playing you. That's the way the deal is, baby. I was cast. That I'm so, like it or not, I'm sorry. That's, this is the actor who was chosen to play you. You mean the, the character doesn't like yeah, you? Yeah, some characters don't like me. They don't like me. And that's okay. It doesn't matter. They don't have to like me. And I don't have to even like them. It doesn't matter. It's like, you know, if I played Hitler, do I like Hitler? No. Is Hitler going to like me? Probably not. Mm -hmm. But we're going to find a way to work together. Mm -hmm. And you would have to find the humanism in Hitler if you were going to play Hitler. You'd have to find something that you could relate to that wasn't a monster, I would say. Sure. That's empathy. Yeah. And empathy, empathy. empathy is neutral. Mm -hmm. Empathy is not um, a judgment and it's not a sympathy and it's not... Empathy is simply because a torturer can have empathy. And that's how they are very good at what they do. Because they understand what it feels like to have, to be put under the situations that they're putting their their um, victim under. Mm. Well, you do, you, yeah, I wouldn't think of it that way. Actually, when I think about a torturer, I would think about some kind of removal from reality so to be able to do, to do what they do. That, but that's why it is neutral. It's because it's, it is, it's neutral in that they don't, they're not feeling for, and they don't, they don't have a, but they, they have, they can understand what it would feel like psychologically. Yeah, yeah, and that's an empathy. You often make an outline for your characters. Yeah. And did you did I did you read that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I did. Yeah. If it if it works for that character, see that's the other thing. What might have worked for the last character may not work for this one, and I have to be open to that. And that's where it's really scary, because. You know, it's a much better, it's much easier to say, well, you know, X, Y, and Z, pull that little thing out of the bag, and I got that for this one. Maybe this character 
maybe that I, maybe a maybe a, a a graph isn't right for this character. And the outline is what all of the habits, the characteristics, the or you go scene by moments. scene moments. It's the moments, and it's like usually it's sort of you know most characters are going to break down into like uh, you know the the four stages of the Greek kind of character of uh, of of not the hero journey, but you know. Um, you know, uh, obstacle, surrender, and you know, the different stages. I can't think of them specifically at the moment, but usually it breaks down into five mm -hmm. phases. Mm -hmm. And and then I each um, scene, each little scene, I kind of encapsulate, distill down into like one or two words. Mm -hmm. And so I write all those words, and, and then maybe set, maybe 15 of those beats fall under that phase, the next phase, the next phase. And really it came out of the independence and shooting around so fast and all over the place that I could ground myself and I would give a copy to the director so we could both see where I am mm -hmm. in her journey. Mm -hmm. Mapping the journey. Exactly. Sense. It's yeah. a map. Yeah. An orientation. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what are your favorite characters that you've played? Is there anything that you connect to? I know you said director is like really important. Really important. So I think it's more collaborations, like, because the character, like, the, the I shot Andy Warhol was great, but it was the collaboration with Mary Heron. And that collaboration, of course, made the playing of that character um, much richer. Um, of course, you know. I mean, I like being involved um, with everything, and so of course, if the character is the main character, I have more to be involved with. Right. You know, but it's not because I I want to be in every scene, but it's because I I like to um, I love collaborating, and so I like being yeah. in all of it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You know how is she, how are they shooting it? What are we thinking? What's the crew? What you uh -huh. know? We're all in it together. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know. Yeah, it's been a very satisfying career. For very you, right. Yeah. Yeah. And did you always know that this is what you wanted to do? Yeah. 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 When I was very, 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 very And young. you grew up in the Midwest? Mm hmm And did you study? Did you... Yeah, I did. I did. I, I, um, I found um, the Pivens, who uh, taught a lot of people in Chicago. Um, I found them when I was in, um, like, sixth grade. I had done some voiceovers uh, with a friend's dad, and so I put sent myself to acting camp when I was like in eighth grade. Um, was in the acting department in high school. Uh, went to a conservatory. I was kicked out. That didn't work out. Um, Why uh, were you kicked out? Were you unruly? Well, I was going to have to miss one day of school for um, a professional job, which I got the okay from, from everybody except for one teacher. Because mm. you're not allowed to work professionally at, the school, at those conservatories. And um, he said, no, I'm not going to let you go. Mm. And I said, okay, but I, that's how I'm going to pay for the next quarter. And mm. I'm shooting tomorrow. And he said, mm. and you know what? We don't like your attitude. And I said, well, you know what? I don't like your attitude. And that was the end of that. And he said, well, don't come back. You know, I said, I don't want to come back. Uh -huh. Boom. Hang the phone up. That was that. Wow. Discouragements? Disappointments? Did you, did you just, was it a, just a rise from like eighth grade to independent films? And... Or, or were there, did you ever feel like this, no, I, I can't make a living, or I, I'm not going to do this? I would say disappointments came later, which, later. Was, which was unusual, because usually they come early, whereas I kind of, my disappointments came probably, you know, when the independent film started to shift around, and it changed a lot. The, the financial models changed the end of the 90s. Is when I kind of and what happened? Did they did how did that change what you were doing? Well, I think they realized that um, they could. It was an investment. They could make money. I think Harvey Weinstein had a lot to do with the changing, um, because he was running a, a basically a, a a kind of wasn't exactly. It wasn't independent. It was independent from the it, Hollywood it was, studios. It, but but it was him, and, and he he you know he realized with Pulp Fiction was one of the first movies that made money made a profit. I think investors realized it was something that you could invest in. And so it became more of a numbers thing and it became more of a, you want a list of names, you want... And so whereas all the films that I'd done, it was never about... The director was never pressured 
about with a list of names. And all of a sudden, other more famous people wanted to do independence, just like more famous people want to do TV now. Yeah. And so now it's like, um, you know, the list of names just got, you know... So you got, did you get pushed out of the independence to some degree yeah. because of that? Yeah. 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 So you weren't working as much as you had been working. I was... I didn't feel like I had as much opportunity as... Um, as I would have liked, um, and 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 there's lots of reasons for that, and a lot of it's me, and a lot of it's, a lot of it's not me, and it's a mixture, you know, it's it's a mixture. So what happened? So this was we're talking about the '90s now. We're talking about the late '90s. Yeah. Okay. So you had been doing a lot of independent acting and a lot of independent films. Yeah. And so more stars were going into these roles, and you were a little sidelined. Right. What'd you do? Um, I kept, you know, plunging forward, um, going through various things, you know, um, I mean, you, you know, never like, stopped. I never, never stopped. stopped. No, never stopped. No. Um, you know, I had, I had personal things as, as everybody does at various, you know, look, no one skips a grade. Everyone's going to have something happen at some point, you know, that they're going to have to, uh, uh, get conscious about, yeah. and um, you know. I, also, I was exhausted. I had done like five or six films in one year, and so what were they? Well, that was the year I did. I shot into Warhol, Girls Town, um, uh, The Addiction, um, Cold Fever, and uh, one more. Yeah, um, it's all in one a year. Lot. I'd done a lot. a lot, and then I was saying no a lot to things. Um, you know, I was saying no a lot, and I had to wrestle with saying no in general. Like, I would say no when I woke up. I would say no. Like, I would say no to the day. You know, no to... So I had to kind of work on work on that, like you a saying like yes. You mean like your personal... Uh, yeah. Your personal yeah, say attitude no. towards the world. No. You know, yeah. a big no. Yeah. Um, and I found that I was saying no... And um, I needed to be open in ways I wasn't. Um, I didn't realize the business was changing. I was not doing things that maybe I should have been doing or they were saying I should be doing or I don't really know. I'm not completely sure. So, so what happened in that period? You, you were not working so much and you were being negative and feeling like... Yeah. But um, you didn't ever stop. You didn't say, I'm not, doing, I'm not going to be an actress anymore. Right, exactly, and, and and I, I found other things. You know, I mean, I I found I was pushed into other things. Um, you know, uh, like what? Well, I started writing more at that point, and um, um, uh, different theater pieces. You know, yeah. um, different independents um, that might not have come out, or you know. Um, you adjusted to some degree. Oh yeah, you, definitely. You, you I was have to... learning how to adapt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And how, how did being a woman aging in the movie uh, business? Uh, how did you feel about that? Did you worry about that at that point? No, did, no, no, mm -mm. no. Because I was never gonna. That wasn't gonna really be a problem for me in that because I wasn't an ingenue, so that wouldn't have been, you know. A problem. Okay. Yeah. And so what happened after that period? Did did you start getting more work? How long did that last and when did it shift again? Because you work so much now, right? Yeah. Don't you work a lot? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, always have. I've always kept working. It's just um I think that some of the things either weren't coming out or were smaller roles or more ensemble. More ensemble roles, mm -hmm. um, you know. I mean, in some ways, I think because I was doing some voiceovers in a way, I, I think I could I could um, I wasn't as hungry in a way, so I didn't have to get out there and work as hard for yeah. for money. Yeah, because you know, with with careers and with putting in so much time as a professional, you feel like at some point it should just kind of carry you. It should just have its own momentum and take you, and you don't have to. 
work so hard to get work, essentially, you know, that it mm. should just kind of have a momentum of its own. Yeah. Uh, but when that doesn't happen, uh, it can be pretty disappointing. But it sounds like you recovered from that. You, you, yeah. you things changed again. Did it change again as a result of like streaming and, you know, Amazon and Netflix and more uh, opportunities being there? Or did, did things start to change for you before that? Um, I think they started to change. They started to change before that. Um, and as I say, like I've always been working. I've always supported myself. Um, it's been more probably um, my relationship to acting, my relationship to the business. My, I don't even like to call it, really call it the business, but I guess it is. Um, that's sort of where the struggle was in a way. Um, um, being my blocks. I, so, so probably I had to come more to terms with blocks, I guess. Things that were holding me back. And what were they? Well, a lot of things like, um, I mean, I think the, my relationship with my father was complicated. I think that, which a lot of this is a, what my piece is about. A lot of it is about um, uh, I think envy played a role with me and my father. And I think that I was holding back to not um, um, outshine him or something. And so, so in a lot of ways, it's, it's been a, a personal struggle, but, and, 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 and one I've needed to look at and get to come to terms with and get conscious about. And essentially, um, it's about becoming whole and about, about that which is blocking you the task, what is the task? The task is, is to become aware of those things and integrate them in. So if I'm holding back because either because of low self-esteem or because they're, I don't want to outshine my father or whatever, that is not, that is not um, showing up to my life. That is not... I need to deal with that. And right, it's there. You're not. If you don't deal with it, it's gonna hold you exactly. back. Exactly. So, did you go to therapy? What did you oh do? God, I've been oh. in therapy since I, I since I, you were eight. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, really, almost. And I didn't know it. I just didn't. I just didn't want to go to school. And so uh, I said I pretended I was having a nervous breakdown when I was like really young. Really. Well, not really. I was like I was like in eighth grade, and I was like I didn't want to go to school, and I and I didn't do my homework on something. And I was scared, and so I was like, pretended that I had this mannequin head that I'd gotten at a flea market. But it's like, I, I, it was like, and the whole family thought it was funny that I got this mannequin head, and she looked, was really real, and I used it to like scare people. And, but then I was pretending she was talking to me. And my dad was mentally ill, so he was like, don't do that. Because I, 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 he was in a lot of mental hospitals all my life. Oh. So if he knew that, that, that he said, don't, don't fuck oh. around because oh. cause I know people who are actually do, do, who do that. So if, you're, if this is real right now, and I'm like, it is real, it's real. And I, I said, I need to see a therapist. So then I, I, I found myself a therapist. And, yeah, and, and, and like I was 13. like, yeah, and I was like, yeah. I just didn't want to go to school. And, and she was like, of course, like, okay, you know, but she knew it was like really a cry for help. Yeah. Um, but I didn't. I just thought, I just didn't want to go to school. So that's yeah. when I started therapy. Well, but, I mean, <laughs> growing up with a parent who's mentally ill, exactly. yeah, that's rough. Exactly. You know? Yeah. So that's, that's where a lot of my, you know, stuff is, you know, from that. So that's kind of what I was working on in my 30s, I felt like. My 20s, I think I was just probably disassociated. And yeah. not in touch with any of it, and it was all fine. And then the 30s started to get like, uh oh, you know, um, I, I think I got to deal with some of this stuff. Do you feel like it got resolved? Yeah, I feel like I feel like that's the nice thing about getting older. Um, by 50, you know, it's like uh, I'm starting to the the wisdom, the hard earned wisdom, I'm starting to feel, and it's really nice. The hard work. Hard earned, yeah. The yeah. hard work is like, yeah, you know. Um, it's kind of cool to start to feel 
that you know that kicking wisdom. in like, yeah. like I, I I went from there to there. Yeah, something happened in the process of, yeah. of living my life. So what's the dream now? What what is the dream for Lily Town? Well, the dream the, now it's about. Um, you know the whole thing about the getting into the second half of life is is now the it's real it's very real now you know it's like i felt like i was sort of like kind of cradled by time in a way that like you know yeah i'll, I'll do that i'll uh, and now it's like no no are you going to do it or not mm. and yeah what this, are this what is, this is now is it's, it's now yeah. and you know that it's not a dress rehearsal. yeah and yeah, i feel yeah. i can feel that yeah. so now the dream is um um, to um, to step up in a in a in a big way to um, to who I am, you know, to 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 who deeply I am, and that requires a lot. And there's there's moments I was like, I don't know, I don't know, maybe I maybe I'm not gonna step up to who I am, you know, that kind of crossroads. What does that mean to you, though? Does it mean being creative in your projects in a way you're not right now or achieving something that you haven't achieved or stepping up to be who you are what does that mean to you right well it would mean it would mean um um so in my case it's coming to my edge okay so my tendency is to go back is to pull away Retreat. yeah to come to my edge um to um Oh, I remember, oh, yeah. It's Challenging hard. yourself to go places that yeah. you would find difficult to go to. Yeah, it's, um, uh, there was a word that was really cool. Endorse, endorse. Oh, yeah, endorse myself. Uh, be on my side. Um, uh, champion myself. Um, but, you know, it's interesting with endorse because um, that, when you think about endorsing a check, what that would come from is um, get be, being behind somebody. The Latin origin of that is behind. That's why it's on the back of the check. Uh -huh, it's uh -huh, in the back. Uh -huh. You're behind somebody. You are backing somebody up, mm -hmm. um, boosting someone. Yeah, and it's like, yeah. and that's I need. I need backup for myself. Mm -hmm. You know, I need. Mm -hmm. I need to. Um, Reinforcement in a way, almost. I mean, yeah, I, it's very hard to be kind to oneself. Yeah, you know, right. all the New Year's resolutions I've been reading are like, be kinder to yourself, spend more time alone, really give yourself credit for this, and you know, the idea of that it starts with you. It, that it doesn't you. start with the outside world. Exactly. It starts with you. It's an inside job. And that's a hard, yeah. It's that's an a hard job. one for me to understand too, because I get so much from, uh, I am so reactive in some ways to what is given to me in the world that to have it come from inside and not be so dependent on the world, it's not easy. It's hard. Inside job. Yeah. And that's a big that's part a good of it. phrase. I like it's it. It's huge. And that's the thing. It's like it's an inside job and that says so much. So that's where I am, um, and how that would manifest um, is uh, taking my one woman show, getting it out there, not abandoning it, you know, not saying let's just you know don't do it, doing it, um, uh, doing more stuff like doing the show, the Wild in the City, you know, following through on that. Sort of just the TV in, show you're, you've been talking about, yeah. like wildlife in urban areas. Exactly. Yeah. So sort of um, respecting these uh, feelings I have, thoughts, uh, respecting them and following through on them. So that's that's the dream. Yeah. And you get to be on more film locations and get to see more birds. Yeah. I remember we started with birding and um, going back to birding that you don't the birds that you don't see on the East Coast sometimes in Bulgaria when you went to film Leatherface you saw these vultures and you saw these chimney swifts is that what they're called in Austin Texas yeah, and, exactly so you you can combine sometimes the acting world with the birding exactly yeah. exactly and yeah. birds are everywhere I mean that's why they're so cool and I'm I'm not a lister someone who checks off stuff. I mean, I, I'm really, I'm very satisfied with 
behavior and just watching, getting into the the, the local common stuff. Um, yeah. So I I can every location I go to I like just the other Airbnb I was at I I'm staying at the same Airbnb because the guy's really nice and Where? that I've been going out to L A for Grand yeah. Mason. Yeah. And um, I I got birdseed and he let me you know put birdseed in the feeder and so. I know the birds there at that little Airbnb, so I just get to know the birds where I where I stay or film or hang out, and that's a way I. It's a cool way to get to know a city too. Is through the birds. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So you got the connecting with the birds. You got inside job working on Lily to kind of do the things that are maybe not so easy, but that are really meaningful. And I think it's gonna be a good year. Okay. <laughs> No, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm no, I'm taking it. I'm taking it. I really am. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, thank you so thank you. much for talking to me, for meeting me, for showing me how to work the binoculars, and telling me about birds. And thank you. Bad.